Of all the people who did the world good by combating Napoleon Bonaparte and thwarting his ambitions, who do you think did the most good? Well, you could say, well, it, it, it's got to be surely the Iron Duke, Duke Wellington, right? Because he defeated them at Waterloo. Well, maybe not. Oh, some of you might say, oh, no, it'll be a Russian general who threw him back from Moscow and you know the, the retreat from Moscow and the destruction of the, the, the Grand Army. Is, 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 is it that? Mm, possibly not. Oh, you might think, ah, of course, it's Nelson, isn't he? Because if Nelson hadn't smashed uh, Napoleon's f uh, combined Spanish and French fleets at Trafalgar, and then uh, Napoleon would have had so many more options around the Mediterranean and around the rest of the world. Well, yes, it's, it's Nelson, of course. You know, the column in, in London and everything. Well, all of those people are candidates. But in the opinion of Napoleon himself, it was someone that you perhaps haven't even heard of. Sidney Smith, later Sir Sidney Smith. All right, he was born William Smith, but never mind, he, he used his middle name, Sidney Smith. And I believe this man uh, deserves more recognition, and so I'm making this video, which has been sponsored by Audible. More of them later. Now, I, I won't go into all the details of his birth, they were quite mundane. Essentially, he joined the Navy quite early and got a lot of experience early on fighting in the uh, American Revolutionary War also known as the War of Independence. And he distinguished himself in action with his conspicuous bravery such that he came to the attention of his commanders who promoted him to lieutenant. And that was quite remarkable because naval regulation stipulated that you had to be at least 19 to be a lieutenant, whereas he was 16. Yeah, very young. And within a couple of years of that, he had the command of his own ship. So he was rising up the ranks, it seems through merit, though he was reasonably well connected, it seems largely through merit, very, very quickly. Uh, but then, well, do you know, peace broke out and there was nothing for a young naval officer to do at that moment. And he was he was uh, put on half pay and given some time off. So he went travelling and already he was thinking about getting into diplomacy and intelligence. And he, he travelled quite widely to places like uh, Spain and he ended up in, um, in Turkey, in Istanbul. Um, not Constantinople, it's now Istanbul, not Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? Well, that's nobody's business but the Turks. Um, his brother worked for the embassy in uh, Istanbul, and so that was one connection. And so he was building up connections within that world of diplomacy and, and foreign affairs and making connections in places significantly like Turkey. Um, now, uh, one of the things he did was in 1790 get employed by King Gustav III of Sweden who needed a naval advisor and he appointed him, despite that he was only 26 years old at the time, he appointed him as chief uh, naval advisor uh, to the Swedish and gave him command of a squadron, quite a large and significant squadron of the Swedish Navy. And he fought at the Battle of Svenskund and won a staggering victory against the Russians who were the enemy at that time. And uh, the Russians lost 64 ships uh, to the Swedish, four ships. and. So pleased was King Gustav that he knighted Sidney, and Sidney became Sir Sidney Smith. Um, although he was, of course, not a British knight at this point, he was a Swedish knight, and many of his fellow officers uh, teased him for many years after that as the Swedish knight. Now, one unfortunate knack that Sidney had was making enemies, but it seems that he made enemies not of people who actually met him and knew him, but of people who didn't, people high up and elsewhere did not like him for lots of reasons. He had too much initiative and acted, you know, without, well, consulting them. And, and they wanted to be feel, they wanted to feel that they were in control, not this, this guy who's there in the field with lots of initiative doing stuff. Even if it's good, we are supposed to order, order these things, drat it. Um, he also gained the enmity of a lot of British officers in the Royal Navy for that victory uh, at Svenskund because a lot of British officers had been serving with the Russian Navy and got killed in that battle. Uh, well, I suppose that's the risk you take with foreign adventures. Anyway, um, he was in Constantinople when war broke out with the French, yes, again. Uh, now, in post-revolutionary France, there were an awful lot of people who really didn't like this revolutionary France thing at all. And though they might not have been the greatest fan of all the various Louis that had, had, had been king, uh, for so long into the past, um, they preferred it to the reign of terror uh, which was taking place in France at the time under people like Robespierre. So there were loads of revolts against the revolution and these people were often referred to as royalists even if they weren't strictly speaking royalists and several cities including Toulon rebelled against the reign of terror. So um, 
he heard, oh, there's a war on. Great. I'm, I'm, I'm a naval officer. Well, sort of. I'm not actually a serving naval officer at the moment. I'm on half pay and have been, been um, sort of put out to pasture for a bit. But then, you know, what the hell? I'll recruit a load of guys and get myself to Toulon. We can sort out the paperwork later. I want to do my bit. So he arrived there and made himself available to uh, Lord Admiral Hood, or Admiral Lord Hood, who was uh, commanding the defence of the city with an international force, including uh, quite a few um, uh, uh, Spanish, but of course also lots and lots of French. And they were holding out against the besieging Republican forces. Now, in command there was one colonel, uh, an artillery colonel whose name was Napoleon Bonaparte. And this was the first time that uh, Sir Sidney and Napoleon Bonaparte actually were pitted against each other. And from that moment on, Napoleon, who was a very superstitious man, uh, got this idea that somehow Sir Sidney was like his, his nemesis. And everything, every time he came across this guy's name, it, it seemed to fill him with a degree of foreboding. Even other people called Smith that he encountered uh, made him uh, stop and darken and sometimes go silent. Well, this was, as I say, the first time they crossed paths. Uh, Sir Sidney was supposed to be have lots of support from various Spanish troops, but he didn't get that. So instead, he sallied out, just himself and a few naval personnel, to, you know, set fire to the French fleet a bit which he did, and he destroyed half the French fleet by fire. And would you believe it, later he got criticised for not destroying all the fleet, which I think is a bit much, frankly. I mean, you know, if you destroy half the French fleet, that's, you know, that's a good night's work, isn't it? I would have thought so. Anyway, um, this officer doing his, his operation so much harm uh, really stuck with Napoleon in his mind, and he wrote, uh, vivid descriptions of the burning fleet and his uh, feelings at the time. So um, that was the first time the two of them, uh, the two of them crossed swords, if you like. So Napoleon found out who was that officer, and he found out that was Sir Sidney Smith. This is significant because a few years later, in uh, 1796. Uh, Sir Sidney was doing something that he was uh, something of a specialist in. He was uh, doing a uh, an inland waterway operation. He didn't actually do much fighting in the open sea. Almost all the operations that Sir Sidney got involved with were within sight of land or even in, in rivers and so forth. Anyway, he was uh, trying to capture a French ship in Le Havre uh, and it was all going very well. He'd got in there with just a few small rowing boats and uh, unfortunately luck was against him. Uh, the weather turned, the wind, the wind uh, changed direction just at the wrong moment and he ended up getting captured. Now, in those days, what you did when you got captured was you wrote to the commander and said, uh, terribly sorry, uh, you know, what with, you know, trying to fight a war against you and everything, but, you know, uh, you're trying to do the same to us. Um, you've got prisoners. We've got prisoners. Let's just exchange prisoners. Uh, here are my details. And could you please make the arrangements? And this was the standard thing. And it normally happened. Unfortunately, the man into whose hands the letter was put was called Napoleon Bonaparte. And he looked and he saw the name Sir Sidney Smith and thought, oh yes, fate has delivered this man into my hands. And he had him thrown into prison, uh, in the Temple Prison in Paris. And uh, he repeatedly tried to get him tried with arson, would you believe. Uh, the, his, his idea was that because he wasn't technically a serving officer at the time, that makes him a non-combatant and so by the rules of war maybe. Is that arson? Um, and anyway, nobody actually did prosecute Sir Sidney for arson. I suspect it's because they, they looked at the situation and thought, well, we'll never get this charge to stick there. You're being ridiculous, Napoleon. Who do you think you are, Emperor? Ordering, ordering some around. <laughs> Honestly, Napoleon. Um, so uh, that didn't happen, but he was, that is Sir Sidney, in that prison for two years. And while he was in that prison, uh, he wrote a letter to Napoleon. Uh, he wrote it on the shutters to his cell. And I want to uh, read you a bit of the letter that he wrote now uh, from this book uh, called Beware of Heroes. Beware of Heroes by Peter Shankland, which is uh, one of the books that I've read about uh, Sir Sidney. Um, one has to admit that fortune's wheel makes strange revolutions, but before it can be truly called a revolution, the turn of the wheel must be complete. Today you are as high as you can be, but I do not envy you your happiness, because I have a still greater happiness, and that is to be as low in fortune's wheel as I can go. 
so that as soon as the capricious lady who turns the wheel does so again, I shall rise for the same reason that you shall fall. I do not write this to distress you, but to bring you the same consolation that I have when you reach the point where I am. You will occupy this same prison. Why not you as well as I? I did not expect to be shut up here any more than you do now. But of course, I don't have to convince you that you will come here, because to read these lines, you must be here. I assume you will have this room, because the jailer here is a good man. He will give you the best room, just as he did for me." Well, um, uh, that is what he wrote then, and then uh, he escaped. He escaped because he had help, and he had the help of pro-royalist or anti-republican uh, friends in Paris, who at some risk to themselves, helped him escape. So he escaped and uh, joined the Navy again and uh, carried on with his work. Now, he was, as I say, very involved with uh, diplomacy and matters around the world. And he looked at the situation and uh, he advised the Foreign Office of his military assessment and his assessment too of Napoleon's character. He said, this Napoleon guy who's coming to power is tremendously ambitious and I predict that he's going to invade Egypt. Now, at this point, the Royal Navy didn't have bases around the Mediterranean. Uh, the Royal Navy had actually largely pulled out of the Mediterranean. So uh, that left it as, a, as a, a bit of a playground for the, the, the French fleet. And Napoleon was stupendously ambitious. He wanted to be another Alexander. He also, in his own words, wanted to make the English tremble. He saw the English as the ultimate enemy. But how could he do this? Well, he could emulate Alexander by taking an army, roughly the size of Alexander's, and replicating his feats. He could land in Egypt, conquer Egypt, and then go anti-clockwise around conquering uh, Lebanon and Palestine and so forth, up to uh, Istanbul, take out the, the, the Ottoman Turks, and then go through Vienna, conquering that, and then return to France. And then, my goodness, he would have complete control of the Eastern Mediterranean and all the trade with the, the Near East and the Middle East and the, even the trade routes to the Far East. He'd have control of the Dardanelles. He would be in such a strong position. And at the time, there was no one to stop him doing this. There were, in fact, no organised armies in a position to stop any French invasion anywhere between the Mediterranean and India. It is even possible that he was harbouring some ambitions to do what Alexander did and take India as well. Because could you imagine if he'd taken India and held it, something that Alexander didn't manage to do? Well, he would have gone one up on Alexander. Uh, as I say, Napoleon was a very weirdly ambitious man. Anyway, so Sidney was right. Um, and uh, the, uh, the British, uh, when they realised that this was a, a feasible plan, put together a task force and went to Egypt and uh, arrived with a big army and a big fleet and said, right, the French are coming. Uh, we think uh, you really ought to do something about it. We're here to help. And they were sent packing. The local uh, rulers said, oh, don't be ridiculous. Uh, these are the, the Mamelukes. Uh, don't be ridiculous. Um, uh, be off on your way. And in fact, uh, the local ruler actually forbade them from taking on supplies, which is a very odd thing to do. One, because he didn't actually have the authority to do that. There was no war on. The British could have just bought supplies and, and that would have been just fair trade. Uh, but also, uh, Nelson and uh, his task force was in a perfectly good position to just take everything they wanted by force anyway. But, meekly they said, all right, on your own head be it, and they sailed away again. Which was perhaps a bit of a shame, because the French then turned up and, yep, conquered Cairo and Alexandria. Oops. Uh, so then, back came Nelson with the fleet, and we have the Battle of the Nile, in which Nelson pretty comprehensively beat the French and destroyed uh, half of its fleet, uh, in the in the mouth of the Nile itself. So uh, huzzah for Nelson, well done. Um, and Nelson was expecting great rewards, but actually he didn't get all the rewards of diplomatic um, positioning that he was expecting because this chap, Sir Sidney Smith, much to Nelson's annoyance, was, was given a role which he saw as wrong because Sir Sidney Smith was sort of uh, a diplomat and, and sort of a, uh, a soldier and, and sort of a, a navy man at the same time, because he was, he was doing this, this terra marique, this land and by sea. He was landing parties of people using his own initiative here and there. But hang on, that's army work. But hang on, no, no, stick to the navy. And what are you doing all this diplomacy? The thing is that he knew a lot of people in the area, 
Uh, I don't actually, I haven't been able to find out what languages he spoke, but presumably, I get the strong impression that he was a bit of a linguist, so he probably uh, had some Turkish and maybe some Arabic, and uh, so he, to some degree, he was able to talk to the locals. So he had connections in the area uh, and contacts, of course, within the diplomatic service as well. Um, but this rankled with Nelson, and Nelson did not like this Sidney Smith guy, even though he didn't actually know him personally. Um, and one of the things he didn't like about Sir Sidney was that Sir Sidney was this young, come up through the ranks really quickly guy who kept using his own initiative rather than following the orders given him by his senior commanders, which is a bit rich because that's exactly what Nelson did but when he was younger. But um, now Nelson was in charge and he didn't want any you know, young Nelson types like him you know, defying him. Dratted. Anyway, um, the French, however, still had a big land army. Uh, but that land army was now stranded largely. The, the, the Royal Navy was powerful enough to stop him leaving and his fleet was now half smashed in. But what he could do was carry on with his plan, which was to conquer his way anti-clockwise uh, ar around the Mediterranean. And he attacked various places that Alexander attacked, partly, I think, because Alexander attacked them and he wanted to emulate Alexander. And the slaughter was horrendous. It was extraordinarily brutal rule. And uh, when he took, for instance, Jaffa, uh, it used to be called Joppa, but uh, in, by this period it was called Jaffa, uh, even after the garrison had surrendered to him and he had agreed terms, he had them all massacred. About 4,000 garrison, uh, he had just taken down to the beach and had them all bayoneted. And um, he wasn't too squeamish to, to watch it being done. Napoleon was an absolutely horrendous person. It's, it's, the more you, you learn about uh, Napoleon, the more difficult it is to believe that he could have been any worse. Now, of course, there have been a lot of monsters in history, and there are people like oh, Chairman Mao and Stalin and so forth who have killed considerably more people than, than Napoleon managed to kill. Although, don't forget that in, in, in the, the mid-20th century, when Mao and Stalin were doing their stuff, there were far more people in the world to kill, and they had railways and, and aircraft and poison gas and radio and all these modern inventions which made being utterly horrendous to large numbers of people so much more efficient. Uh, I suspect that in, in terms of atrocities per capita, um, Napoleon might, might actually be top dog here. Um, he killed over two million of his own countrymen, and goodness knows how many million uh, of other people around the world. So the amount of death that, that he brought to the world was quite an, an unnecessary death, was quite extraordinary. But he was also an appalling person in so many other ways, some of which I probably am likely to, to mention in this. For a start, he had all these people bayoneted. And the men that he was commanding, some of them were utterly appalled. Some of his, his, uh, his officers, uh, of course, his officers were literate and they, they've left records, uh, were absolutely disgusted with the, this massacring of people who had uh, uh, accepted a, a surrender, when, when, after he'd accepted their surrender. And um, some of them even became suicidal. They were so disgusted at what they'd, they'd done following his orders. Um, and it was shortly after that, actually, that plague, actual proper plague, not just some disease or other, but plague broke out in the French camp as though it was some sort of biblical retribution for the, the, the atrocity. But anyway, he went round burning and murdering and lying his way around the Mediterranean. Yeah, he was an astonishing liar. I mean, a really bad liar. I mean, a bad liar in the sense that he told absolute whoppers, but also a bad liar in that he told lies that were obviously going to be discovered. People were obviously going to see through these lies. And, and he was, at least in, in this uh, part of his career, not believed by the locals. He told uh, all the local Christians, the Coptic Christians and so forth, uh, that uh, he was there on a crusade against the Muslims and he would protect them against the Muslims. And he was telling all the Muslims that he himself, Napoleon, was a Muslim, uh, there to protect them from the nasty uh, Christians and perhaps to exterminate these, these verminous Christians. Um, and he was telling all the various different versions um, uh, of the Muslims, that he was this particular type of Muslim and, and was against that sort of Muslim, or he was against this particular tribe and would protect them against the others. And it was an incredibly ineffective uh, piece of uh, a propaganda campaign because all Sir Sidney Smith had to do was take Napoleon's propaganda leaflets that he'd been distributing about the place 
and use the same leaflets because all he had to do was take the leaflets that were, that were meant to, for those people and uh, show them to those people and I can have some of yours find you and show you those oh and you might be interested in these ones and everyone just saw that he was just lying to everyone and could not be trusted but he still was a big powerful commander in command of a big powerful army and therefore to be feared. So there was a definite danger that if he won then a lot of people would join him because you know you've got to join the victor haven't you otherwise the victor turns on you and this guy will definitely turn on you and kill everybody. Anyway so Sidney took the initiative. He saw that the Busying himself around in Alexandria in places like that wasn't what was needed. He put together a force and on his own initiative he went to a place called Acre and there uh, he aided the local commander, the, 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 the local Muslim commander who was the man who at the time uh, was holding out against the French and in fact had himself taken the initiative. Uh, he had for instance put troops into, into Jaffa and, and, and other places. Um, this guy was the Pasha Jezar who was also known as, well, it, it, it translates to slasher. He was 60 years old and uh, was a big, ferocious man who um, showed nobody respect, apart from, interestingly, Sir Sidney Smith, um, whom he showed a lot of respect straight away. And that immediately made Sir Sidney Smith very, very respected by all the people uh, that he was dealing with in that area. So that made things a lot easier. So slasher, Jezar, um, had uh, seen that Okay, this is a guy I can do business with and he's useful. And oh, he was very useful. So Sidney Smith, um, for instance, just happened to capture all the French guns that were on, the, on their way to the siege. And uh, he then denied the use of the coast road by bombarding it from the sea uh, to the, um, the marching French army. And he then landed um, a load of troops, naval troops mainly, uh, and guns and installed them in Acre and did an awful lot to repair the defences which were in a very very poor state. And uh, uh, for all this work uh, he was uh, given various rewards. Um, oh, uh, he, was, he was also um, given one, one award that had previously been given to one uh, Saint Richard uh, that we know as Richard the Lionheart, yes, who of course had, uh, had, um, had taken Acre uh, when he was uh, batting around the, the Middle East, the Near East. Anyway, so he installed himself in Acre, which was smack in the path of the advancing Napoleonic army and was commanded by the guy that Napoleon had to defeat if he could show everyone in the region that, that, that he was now in control. And uh, we are told that the hillsides filled with people watching the siege, partly out of fascination presumably, but also because they needed to know which of these two sides was going to be the winner, which side are we going to have to side with in order to preserve our own lives. Now the siege lasted about three months and was absolutely epic and I cannot possibly give you all the details but there was a huge amount of ebb and flow, an awful lot um, of times it really looked as though the French were going to take this, this tiny miserable little town uh, but they kept being flung back again and again even after they made breaches in the defences, breaches in the walls which uh, Sir Sidney had been uh, quickly plugging up um, they still couldn't take the town and Napoleon's frustration grew and grew and grew. Uh, now he had uh, a General Kleber, um, Jean-Baptiste Kleber uh, under him and um, Jean-Baptiste was quite a different man from Napoleon in, in lots of ways. Um, this is him and isn't that hair great? Yeah, I mean that's a proper wild hair. I hope one day when I go grey I'll be able to, I don't think I will though, I think my hair will be too thin by then but you know if I could I would. Uh, anyway, um, this man was a problem for uh, for, for Napoleon. He was competent, he was an ardent Republican, as in a proper Republican, an actual French Republic, not this Napoleonic version of a Republic. In other words, something a bit more like a, a monarchy. Um, and his troops were really respected him and even loved him and were getting loyal to him. So he had to keep Kleber down. And Kleber also was one of the, just about the only person, in fact, as far as I can tell, who, who dared speak up in staff meetings uh, against these stupid ideas that Napoleon kept coming up with. And he, he, um, he also dared even mock him. At one point they made a breach in the walls. He said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a spectacular breach, that is. I think a cat could get through that. Uh, or when he, shortly after he turned up, he had a look at the trenches that Napoleon had, uh, had dug. And he said, you call these trenches? Well, it's all right for you, but they only come up to my waist. Um, and I, I dare say that probably rankled with Mr. Bonaparte a little bit. Um, anyway, um, Kleber was, it seems, honourable 
and straightforward and someone that Sidney could do business with but Napoleon just wasn't. And the, the pettiness, the spite, the nastiness, the utter callousness uh, of the lives of others showed itself when Napoleon was absolutely uh, adamant that he hadn't lost. It was a victory. Despite the fact that it was quite definitely a loss, he'd not uh, achieved his aim, had been thrown back and had lost a huge number of men and guns and so forth. In fact, he ended up losing almost all his guns. These were the guns. One of Napoleon's maxims, sorry, a bit of a sideline, uh, one of his maxims was you never abandon your guns. You can abandon your, your, your food, you can abandon your allies, you can abandon loads of things that you can abandon, but you'd never abandon your guns. And he was forced in the retreat to abandon guns, guns that had famously crossed the Alps with him, had been with him for so many of his earlier campaigns, he had to abandon them on, in the retreat. And when he went past uh, Jaffa on the way back, the bodies that had just been left there, apparently they, the stink was just indescribable. Anyway, um, so he's going up and down the desert, losing men to thirst and loads to wounds. Now, I was going to say he was very, uh, he was very petty and spiteful. In order to show that he hadn't lost, he had to not agree for the evacuation of the wounded. So Sidney wrote to him and, and offered uh, evacuation of the wounded as, as, you know, as, as, a, as a good soldier would. But if Napoleon had to do a deal with the enemy in order to uh, uh, get his wounded out, then that would mean that he must have lost. So he wasn't going to admit that. So tough to save his face he didn't, uh, he didn't strike a deal. Now, in fact, uh, as it turned out, a lot of the wounded were evacuated and had been told a lie, one of many, a lie by Napoleon, which was that Sir Sidney um, sent home prisoners in plague ships. And it seemed a lot of his men did actually believe this. Uh, and so when they found out that they weren't going to be sent home in a plague ship, they were almost pathetically grateful. Um, anyway, uh, another uh, petty thing he did was burn every village, destroy and burn all the crops that he came across uh, during his uh, campaign as well. Um, just uh, this scorched earth policy, just uh, the, the level of spite. But possibly the most, one of the most spiteful things he did was uh, when he finally decided, right, I'm going to give up on this siege and leave, he ordered all the remaining ammunition they had to be fired. Not, not at the defences, but just into, into the civilian part of the town. It's just an act of spite. What, what military purpose did that serve? Um, if anything, all it did was turn more people even more against him. It, was, it wasn't just spiteful, it was really stupid. But there you go. This was Napoleon, one of the worst human beings ever to have disgraced the face of the earth. So, uh, Napoleon then uh, gave up. He thought, right, I can't now carry on with this campaign. I'm not going to make it to Istanbul. The Turks have now mobilised against me. Uh, so um, he left. He, he's, he, he got away himself back to France, slipped away um, uh, by sea and got back to France, leaving Kleber absolutely in the doo-doo. He left Kleber with no guns, no food, no money or any other means to pay his troops and no fleet. Napoleon took all the ships. So uh, Kleber was completely stranded. But Fortunately, he was an honourable man who could do a deal with Sir Sidney. And uh, Sir Sidney um, uh, arranged a meeting at a place called, a place called El Arish and there struck a deal. And his deal was this. He would organise it such that the 18,000 troops under Kleber would be taken back to France safely by the British Navy. Um, they would own nothing. Uh, save the, the ground they were standing on uh, when, when they were actually in uh, Egypt, but they would be taken back to France and that's it, a peace. And the Turks were quite happy with that. Uh, the Turks, the Turks uh, were cock a hoop. They were, they were so happy, in fact, with uh, the way uh, that the British got rid of the French, uh, that um, uh, one of the many little consequences of this is that uh, a chap called Elgin uh, got uh, uh, the permission to um, remove, he did actually have to pay quite a lot of money for them as well, but he, was, he got permission to remove some statues from a, a temple on a, on a hill in Athens. Uh, these are now known as the Elgin Marbles, and you can see them in the British Museum. And if anyone tells you that they were stolen, uh, or they weren't, they were paid for and they had permission. And at the time, um, Athens was a city that was in 
a country called Turkey, so you dealt with the Turks. Anyway, so, sorry, another little, another little sort of side snippet of history there, um, a side effect of what was going on. So, why would Sir Sidney want, particularly, Kleber and 18,000, and a, whole, a largely intact French army to go back to France? Well, he saw Kleber as a good bulwark against, bulwark against Napoleon, because he saw Kleber as an honourable, ardent, genuine Republican, and someone who was not at all a friend of Napoleon's, and someone who, like Sir Sidney, saw that Napoleon's ambitions were really dangerous to the point of deranged. Um, so if Kleber had gone back to uh, to uh, France and arrived, this very, very popular commander with an army loyal to him because this army saw how he had looked after them, whereas Napoleon had definitely not looked after them, um, th he would have then perhaps have been a very good counter to Napoleon's rise in to power within uh, France. But it didn't happen. And I'll tell you what actually happened after uh, I tell you about my sponsors. Now, Audible, and just in case you don't know, is an enormous uh, website which has loads of audio books uh, on it. Now, uh, it's the new year. Well, sort of. Well, it's January. It's close to the new year. And you may be thinking of, of you know, resolutions. A new year, the new you. Yes. So what you could do is, is you know, get yourself into an improving book. Because books, this is well known, are improving things. So what uh, pertinent to the Napoleonic Wars and improving this could, could you be listening to? Well, how about a bit of Tolstoy, yeah? How about... Yeah, the big one, war and peace. And if you want, you know, bang for your buck, as the Americans put it, um, well, war and peace is 61 hours long when it's read out. If you, you know, go for the unabridged version, they do have an abridged version, but, uh, you know, you want the full thing. Um, so if you've got a one hour commute to work, uh, that's, that's two hours a day. You can, there you go, you could have war and peace ticked off as you know, one of those things which one of these days you'll get round to reading possibly. Well, this is one way of doing it. So in one way to improve yourself is to get a bit of Tolstoy in you. Although, of course, you don't have to choose this book. You can choose uh, from the unrivaled large collection that they have. Now, um, there's a new thing you can do if you're an American viewer. You can text using your, your clever telephones 500 500. I think, or 500-500. I'm not entirely sure how to say it. I don't really know what this is, but I think it's 500-500. And you text Lindy Beige. That's L-I-N-D-Y-B-E-I-G-E. -E. Yes, E before I. I know it doesn't obey the usual rule. It's like the word there or weird. It's just you know, different. So, uh, what is that again? L-I-N-D-Y-B-E-I-G-E. Good. OK, so um, and uh, then it'll take you to the free offer, one month's free membership of the site and one free download, which if it's if it's uh, Tolstoy is 61 hours of listening, um, though a lot of other books are, are shorter. But then again, you know, uh, you're getting one thing for free regardless what it costs. So you may as well go for one of the more expensive ones, don't you think? Well, I would. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, otherwise you can go to uh, www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige and that's another way of, of getting there and it's the same thing uh, one free book uh, free membership uh, for a month so there you go Audible now back to uh, Sir Sidney and what was going on yes so this treaty which had been signed agreed by the Turks and uh, the, the French alike uh, and the Mamluks everyone was happy Mamluks were the people who were running uh, Egypt uh, but they were actually subservient, at least in nominally, to the Sultan of uh, the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, um, got it got countermanded. Uh, Lord Keith, who was running the show, he was the the the, 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 the chief uh, at the time, uh, and in, he was in, in agreement with Nelson. Said, "You can't have Sir Sidney just carrying on like this and making decisions like this and dealing with the enemy like this, and, and you know, no one's given him permission to do any of this." So it was countermanded. The deal was off. And Sir so Sidney, now of course, when you uh, agree to surrender to, to someone and uh, you agree that uh, you, you agree kindly to be transported away by him under his protection, uh, you are asked to do things like vacate the fortresses that you're occupying and so forth. It's, you know, it's only right and fair. Um, but that was the deal. And Sir so Sidney, when he knew that the deal was off, he sent word to Kleber saying, I think you better reoccupy those forts because I'm afraid uh, I can't give you the protection that I, uh, I thought I was going to be able to give you. I'm sorry. Now, you could say that that was a very honourable thing he did, or you could say he was being treacherous to his own nation. Um, I, I'm inclined towards the former of those two, though I, I do see that there's an argument for the latter. Uh, 
Anyway, so then that meant that it all had to be done again, but this time by force. So, um, so Sydney was sent to uh, southern Turkey to rehearse an unusual thing, an opposed landing. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a character who turns up at this point of the story. He's actually pretty irrelevant to the story, but he's just an extraordinary character. I think I may as well just throw him in. Um, the local ruler, uh, where they were rehearsing uh, the, the, the opposed landings, or incidentally, uh, Sir Sidney designed a landing craft for the purpose. Um, when he, this, this nut brown grizzled guy with a big beard and swathed in the, the, the big you know, cloth garments of, uh, of the locals, uh, when he saw some Highlanders in Sir Sidney's forces, he addressed them in Gaelic. It turned out that his name was Campbell and he was from Argyleshire and that he got into a bit of trouble in Argyleshire so decided he better skip town for a bit and go adventuring and he ended up fighting against the Russians for the Turks and he got his nose cut off and uh, had a silver one made to replace it uh, which he had painted flesh coloured. Tick tick tick. Um, I don't know, a bit weird. It's one of those characters who if you saw him in a film you go, oh no, come on, that's ridiculous. But there you go. Sometimes uh, history is stranger than fiction. Anyway. Uh, he rehearsed for the opposed landings there, and when they reckoned they'd, they'd got, it, uh, got it sorted, it went ahead. And it was a successful opposed landing, but a very costly one. Fighting the French under these circumstances was very difficult. Opposed landings are always difficult. The British suffered 600 casualties in the first half an hour of fighting. Um, but they did manage to get inland. Uh, Sir Sidney himself uh, was in the thick of it. Uh, he actually uh, fought so hard that he, uh, his sword broke. And uh, he was in command of getting uh, the, the, the naval forces ashore and what they were doing and getting the guns ashore and during the battle itself actually the use of those naval guns on shore. Um, so it is perhaps a little unfair that he wasn't mentioned in any of the uh, write-ups of the, uh, how the battle went written up by the, uh, the British Army officers at the time, which um, ah, seems a little, as I say, a little unfair. Uh, anyway, uh, one interesting thing that happened during this battle was uh, when the French heavy cavalry smashed into the British line um, what what was meant to happen in those days is when the heavy cavalry smash through a, a line of infantry, that line of infantry is meant to flee in panic and scatter and no longer be an effective fighting force. That's it. You you sweep away a line of infantry with your cavalry. Only what happened uh, at this point was that the French cavalry charged at them and the the British uh, shot at them and then they went smash through the line and the British then turned round and carried on shooting, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to do. You're supposed to scatter. You, you got it wrong there. But anyway, uh, so the British defeat the French again and um, force them to sign a surrender. And would you believe it? The terms of the surrender were the same as at the conference of El Arish. So if they had just let uh, Sir Sidney just do what he had, had done, then 20,000 lives would have been saved. 20,000 men died in that campaign who would have been otherwise alive. Um, and other nasty things happened. For instance, the, the Turks um, sent, over, uh, sent over a force which um, uh, massacred a load of Coptic Christians. Uh, Sir Sidney himself rushed when he, he, he found out where they were going in the uh, Rosetta mouth of the, the Nile um, uh, to save the Coptic, but he, he was there too late and the deed had been done. You see, those Coptic Christians made the mistake of worshipping the same imaginary friend in a very slightly different matter, uh, manner. So obviously, obviously they had to die. Anyway, so now instead of a uh, a unified large army of 18,000 French under a commander going back to France and possibly acting as a bulwark against as a counter to Napoleon. Instead, a half-sized shattered remnant of an army without its leader went back to France because Kleber was assassinated. We are told by an Arab student, but an awful lot of people will have wanted Kleber dead, so who paid the student? Uh, it's a little bit suspicious, but anyway. Kleber, unfortunately, was dead. His body was shipped back to France, but Napoleon didn't allow it to land because Napoleon was a git. Um, and so that, uh, that, camp that campaign uh, ca came to a close. And uh, again, um, uh, our man found himself at a bit of a loose end. He, he went back to Britain uh, for a bit, uh, where he found that he was ridiculously old-fashioned 
Uh, his clothes, uh, he was so old-fashioned, he looked positively French. That's how out of date he was. Uh, you know, floral waistcoats and tailcoats and cravats were in now, and oh my goodness, man, we'll have to get you some, some decent clothes. You can't go out like that. What will people think? Um, he was, unfortunately, broke. You see, the Foreign Office had disavowed what he'd done uh, in signing the, the con at the conference of uh, El Arish, uh, and so the, it was felt that he couldn't be paid. So he didn't get any money for any of the things he'd done. He had just thwarted Napoleon's uh, entire campaign in the East uh, with his amazing defence of Acre, and he was broke. But people knew about what he'd done, and a lot of uh, supportive members of the general public, with whom he was tremendously popular because he was a great hero, uh, they saw that he was he was all right. Um, and uh, a number of other things happened in his life. He got married. He, he became the MP for Rochester for a bit. Um, and uh, uh, oh, I just remembered. I, I was going to read from this book a letter that he wrote to Napoleon. I don't. Want, it's somewhat out of uh, sequence now, unfortunately. But um, it's it's a it's a good letter. Um, so this was uh, after Napoleon's defeat uh, at uh, Acre. And uh, Napoleon hasn't actually left the area yet, so it's quite easy to get a letter to him. And of course, everyone knew uh, in uh, Napoleon's staff that a letter from Sir Sidney had arrived. And um, it said, General, I have known for some days that you've been planning to raise the siege. I, who have no cause to love you, uh, to say the least of it, uh, should never have said so, but circumstances have led me to wish that you should reflect on the instability of human affairs. Would you ever have thought that a poor prisoner in the cells of the temple, that an unfortunate man on whose behalf you refused to interest yourself for a moment when you were in a position to do him a signal service, for at that time you were all powerful, would you ever have thought, I say, that that same man would become your opponent and force you, in the sands of Syria, to raise the siege of a miserable little town? These are events, you must admit, that surpass all human calculations. Believe me, General, you must adopt a more modest line of thought. And the man who tells you that Asia is not a theatre created for your glory will not, in fact, be your enemy. This letter is a small revenge that I now allow myself. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry that that came a little bit out of order. So, he's become MP for Rochester, has got married. Yeah, he's done various other things. Um, and uh, he now uh, looks around for other avenues. And again, he visit, visits places like Spain and Portugal and does more uh, looking at diplomacy and so forth. And he gets interested in a campaign in, well, first in Sicily, and then he widens it to, to Italy. Now, he didn't actually have orders to do all the stuff that he did in Italy because... He was one of these people who thought that if you want to defend this place, uh, rather than just cluster around that and wait for the, atta the attacker to mass at his leisure and then at a time of his choosing attack at a point of his choosing, much better to defend this place by attacking the enemy in lots of other places where the enemy is. So we're the Royal Navy, so you know, rather than wait for uh, Napoleonic forces in, in Italy to, to mass and attack Sicily, let's, let's go up and down and around Italy and just generally cause havoc. Uh, creating little forts and so forth. This, uh, quite a few times um, uh, he would create a fort, sometimes sacrificing one of the ships of a fleet. So he would turn up and then just beach a ship, take all the guns off it and use the wood for the ship. And so the ship would very quickly whoosh, turn into a fort. You want a fort very quickly? Sail up with a ship and turn the ship into a fort. Bingo. Okay, you've got one uh, ship fewer in your, in your fleet, but hey, a fort which you can then can, uh, uh, be used as a base. Uh, for later operations, and uh, he used this in um, isles off, small islands off France a number of times. Anyway, sorry, another sidetrack. Um, Napoleon, um, oh yeah, that's right, and he fought at the Battle of Maida, is quite significant. So there was the Battle of Maida, which was uh, 1806, and this seems to be quite a significant battle. Uh, he uh, himself became leader of the Massey. Uh, he became leader of partisans in the area. Uh, he seemed to be very good at winning over locals and turning them against the French. Um, and at the Battle of Maida, which was a decisive victory for the British, uh, he used partisan forces in the rear of uh, the French. Uh, he used um, naval vessels off the coast that were aiding in the battle as it was going on. Uh, so again, this was land and by sea, terra marique uh, operation. Uh, and uh, I don't know quite how involved he was in the tactics of the battle itself with regard to letting, uh, say, the infantry involved. 
But it does seem to have been very significant for uh, one reason being that uh, one Arthur Wellesley did a very detailed study of this battle to see how do we beat the French, particularly on land. And he was very impressed by a number of things. He was very impressed by the cooperation of naval forces on land and ships at sea cooperating with the army on land and how effective they were. He also learned an awful lot about how partisans could be used uh, in uh, situations such as this. And he also, according to most historians until recently, looked at how the French attacked in column and the British defended in line and how the line, British line against the French column uh, tactic was very, very effective. And he concluded that unless the French changed their tactics, uh, well, he'd be able to beat them. Uh, now, more modern revisionist historians have said that mm, there's a problem with that. As far as we can tell, the French really did not use column very much in this battle. They were deployed almost entirely in lines, so maybe that's a detail which is not quite right. But even so, this Arthur Wellesley chap went on to do terribly well for himself, and you may know him by an, a, a, a title that he got uh, later, the first Duke of Wellington. And of course, a lot of, a lot of these, these tactics became his, his, uh, his bread and butter in the Peninsular War, which was coming later. Um, France uh, decided with Spain, well, Napoleon, uh, in... in um, conjunction with the Spanish decided that they were going to partition Portugal between them and Portugal didn't like that idea and Portugal and Britain were allies and so uh, Britain got involved in the, in, in the Peninsula War and uh, Sir Sidney was actually a bit involved with that, he went to Lisbon and so forth but I don't want to dwell on that part of the story um, other than perhaps to mention at this point that an awful lot of partisans uh, fought very effectively uh, against the, uh, the French in uh, Spain and uh, the Git um, uh, um, Napoleon seized all his allies, well, seized all his allies' major forts. Okay, yeah, let's do a deal to partition this other uh, the country between us. Yeah, I'll send over a, an army to help you with that. And oh, I seem to have seized all your forts, my ally. And oh, I think I'll actually install uh, my brother as, as, as king of Spain. And uh, Anyway, he was just a, a, a git beyond imagining. However, however bad you think Napoleon was. See, I really have very little, very little in common with people who think that Napoleon was a great man. He was a great man in that he achieved a staggering amount of harm, and if, if that's a way to measure uh, greatness, then, oh, okay, yeah, a great man. Uh, but um, what good did he actually do the world? Oh, he introduced the metric system. Well, one, he didn't introduce the metric system. Uh, because, uh, he, he, admittedly, it was introduced you know, while he was in charge, but he himself actually hated the metric system. Uh, and two, <laughs> it's the metric system. How is that good? No, um, he was responsible for staggering amounts of completely unnecessary death. He was uh, duplicitous and incredibly uh, touchy. In incredibly, um, uh, he couldn't bear to lose face at all. Um, uh, for instance, uh, when, uh, I missed this up, but I'll go back to it. Uh, when uh, he marched back into Egypt, he did so in triumph. Oh yes, as though he'd won a great victory. He in fact lost half his army and most of his guns and uh, his ambitions in the in the east had been thwarted. Uh, but in fact, he marched back as if in a victory, and everyone had to wear garlands. Oh, apart from one unit that had persuaded had. Uh, um, uh, behaved very um, unimpressively during an attack on the breach at one point, he forced that unit to, um, to walk back dressed as women. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great man management, isn't it? That's how to get your troops to love you. Um, and uh, when he arrived in Egypt, uh, there, were, uh, there were Egyptians there who uh, had to celebrate his arrival and shower him from, with gifts on pain of death. Yeah. Oh, uh, but he didn't allow Kleber... Uh, after his victories, uh, any uh, to uh, just to celebrate them at all, just in case his troops, you know, started to you know look up, look up to him a bit better. God, Napoleon was such a git. He was such a git. It's extraordinary. Um, anyway, um, uh, so. Um, uh, Napoleon uh, allies the Russians in 1807. Uh, he is, of course, going to attack them, but then that's standard. He made very peaceful overtures to both the Ottomans and the Mamluks of, of Egypt before attacking them. Uh, he just thought, well, how can I increase the chances of surprise? I know, I'll be really nice to them, then attack them. Oh, I'm just such a genius. Or is it a git? It's a git. Um, and so he's partitioned Spain and... Um, uh, eventually, yeah, there was the continental system that uh, he uh, he brought in. Oh dear, another sidetrack. Very quick. Uh, he, he was, essentially, the continental system involved uh, telling to uh, saying to everyone in Europe, you can't trade with the British. All these ports are closed. You can't allow the British to trade in any of them. So pff, to the British, ha ha, that'll bring them to their knees. This nation of shopkeepers. 
Um, but uh, it didn't actually work because the Royal Navy was very powerful and really frustratingly for, <laughs> for Napoleon, the Royal Navy was just not afraid of him. You see, Napoleon had had cultivated this myth of invincibility, which seemed to really work on his land-based European neighbours. Uh, you know, they were terrified of him, but he just couldn't get this blasted Royal Navy to be frightened of him, which is, you know, quite understandable on the Royal Navy's part, given that the Royal Navy very consistently beat him easily. Um, anyway, the Royal Navy then just blockaded all the ports and said, okay, fair enough, you're not going to trade with Britain or each other. So what are you going to do about that then? And in 1811, the, the Tsar of Russia just thought, oh, this is ridiculous. And uh, he actually lifted, uh, lifted the uh, embargo and started trading with the British again. And that's pro possibly the real reason that... Um, prompted Napoleon to invade Russia. I mean, beyond just wild overambition. Uh, anyway, so we all know uh, that that didn't go too well. 1812 overture and everything. Uh, the march back of the Grand Army, the, the destruction of the, of, of the French army, vast, vast, vast numbers of people on both sides dying. But of course, Napoleon was all right. And he, he came back and... Um, well, yeah, actually, let's, let's, let's zoom forward because this, uh, there are too many sidelines. This story is getting too big. So let's zoom forward to uh, his imprisonment in Elba. Uh, so in, in Elba, um, uh, he turned up to be uh, taken to uh, exile on the island of Elba. And uh, he had <laughs> the cheek of it, the incredible cheek of it. He demanded that he be escorted by British and transported in a British ship because he feared for his own safety. <laughs> yes, an awful lot of people in France wanted him dead at this point. In fact, an awful lot of people in the world wanted him dead, which was entirely understandable. Even his own brother Lucien really uh, regretted having helped him into power. Um, and uh, he then yeah, demanded th that he be uh, uh, taken there by the British, thank you very much. And when he showed up uh, to be escorted to the, the barge, which was going to take him out to the ship, uh, he stepped out of the carriage and, um, trying to you know, look as um, haughty as he could, he um, asked to speak to the captain of the guard. And who was the captain of the guard? It was one Lieutenant Smith. This was Sir Sidney Smith's nephew. And <laughs> history records that at that point his face darkened and he went silent and stayed silent for the rest of the voyage. Anyway, so it was when Napoleon himself wrote his memoirs that he said that it was Sir Sidney Smith who made him miss his destiny. Um, but, uh, of course, we all know uh, that the, you know, the final uh, nail in the coffin was Waterloo. So, incredibly, incredibly, uh, he was able to come back to power yet again, uh, largely by lying uh, again. Um, well, two, I, two, two reasons that he, he came back to power. Well, one was the, the incredible greed of the army. You see, when Napoleon was uh, in charge of things in, in, in France, he made the army really important, really well funded, really powerful, gave, gave it loads of privileges. And then he sort of destroyed it a bit uh, in campaigns in, in Russia and so forth. And uh, then the king came back, yet another Louis. And um, the, the, the army lost its power. So when he turned up and went, oh, uh, I'll, I'll give you all your power and privilege back. They went, oh, I'll really get our power and privilege back. Yay, vive l'empereur. Incredible, isn't it? I mean, he went emperor. He went emperor. He did not king. You look at the portraits done of him at the time when he crowned himself emperor and you can see all oh, the trappings of royalty. The staggering, flagrant hypocrisy of the man. Anyway, um, he also lied to the population. He said that France was in danger and he was the man. He was the man who could save France. Okay, put your faith in me. Give me a massive army. Um, this was a complete lie. The Allies had, in fact, already signed uh, an alliance treaty guaranteeing the borders of France. No one was there. No one was fighting to conquer France or even a bit of France. The borders were guaranteed. They declared war not on France, but personally on Napoleon. But Napoleon used another lie to convince everyone that he was their saviour and that, they, that he was saving them. No, no, he was trying to get them to save his skin. But hey-ho. He was a liar and he fought the Battle of Waterloo and um, during the battle, Sir Sidney was not far away and heard the sound of guns, thought, bang, war, what's this? Right, clicked a few guys together and uh, went towards the sound of the, uh, of the guns and arrived at the battle about halfway through. Uh, he wasn't given a command, a military command uh, in the battle, but instead uh, he was given the task of dealing with the wounded of both sides. Um, 
and uh, as part of, uh, as of his experience of that, he then designed a, a, a new improved ambulance, a six-wheeled thing with a very smooth ride suspension so that uh, the wounded wouldn't be jostled uh, so much as they were moved at speed across a battlefield um, because uh, he, he wasn't impressed with the design of ambulances that was, uh, ambulance that was being used. Anyway, uh, he was then tasked with... Uh, getting various places. He got Amiens to surrender and Arras to surrender and he then organised the safe passage of the king into uh, Paris because they had to get the king into Paris without any bloodshed. So he got these various cities to surrender and was able to organise this and for that, for that, he was given a knighthood. A British knighthood. And so now no one was mocking him for being the, 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 the Swedish knight anymore. Um, uh, so now he was a British knight, and I realise as I get to this stage in the uh, in this rambling story that I've missed out quite a lot of uh, uh, other remarkable things about him. Um, uh, he uh, not only did he do uh, lots of uh, useful work in uh, Italy, but um, he did a lot of diplomatic work for loads of people, including uh, King Gustav, who got ousted because he was pro he was an anti-Napoleon uh, monarch, um, uh, and he tried to do more. Uh, diplomatic work, but tended to get cut out because he um, people saw him as a little bit jumped up. They wanted to be in control, not this other guy. Yeah, he had connections and so forth, and people liked him. But uh, you know, connections and people liking him. You know, tell me, I'm in charge. Um, so he wasn't tremendously successful, but uh, he did uh, mount some campaigns. One of which being he was going to uh, anti-slavery was going to be one of his big things, and he was going to uh, put together a force to take on the Barbary pirates of North Africa, who had for centuries. Uh, been capturing people from uh, Mediterranean shipping and raids on coasts that went as far as Ireland and Cornwall. Uh, whole villages uh, of, of people captured and sold into slavery by the Barbary pirates and he was going to take them on. And it is said by some historians that he invented something. He invented the charity dinner. Now it strikes me as unlikely that he exactly you know, was the first person ever to do anything like that. But certainly uh, for his day it was a novel thing. Uh, so perhaps in the, in the way we know it today, the, the modern charity dinner was invented. You sell tickets and get loads of people uh, to spend a very large amount of money on these expensive tickets and they make speeches telling each other just how wonderful they are to raise money uh, to take on the Barbary pirates. Uh, but then it was actually Napoleon coming to, uh, back into power again and interrupted things and there you go. I missed that out but I've got to be. So, uh, so Sidney Smith. Um, the Wheel of Fortune uh, for Napoleon turned, and it seems that this man, not, not maybe not Wellington, not maybe not Blucher, not maybe not Nelson, not maybe any of those, those you know, the Russian guys, um, whose names unfortunately I um, failed to learn for this, uh, this video. Yes, perhaps it wasn't any of those. Okay, it might have been, of course, you know. But in Napoleon's rather suspicious mind, it was Sir Sidney Smith. <laughs> Sidney Bear!